Um, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first keynote presentation for the Life Science Symposium. Uh, I'm Isaac. I'm with the HGSAC, and I'll be your moderator for this talk. Um, before I introduce the speaker, um, I'd like to remind everyone to keep your microphones muted throughout the presentation. Um, additionally, all questions will be addressed at the end of the talk. Uh, feel free to type any questions th in the chat throughout the presentation, or you may raise your hand uh, during the Q&A ses session and wait to be called on. Um, lastly, this talk will be recorded and put on the HGSAC YouTube channel for your future reference. Um, so today we're honored to have Dr. Una Fitzgerald live from Galway, Ireland, where it's about 4 p.m. Um, her talk is titled, How Fair Is Our Labware? And it'll bring to our attention um, an often neglected topic, uh, sustainability in scientific research. Uh, Dr. Fitzgerald is a professor and the director of the Galway Neuroscience Center at the National University of Ireland, Galway. Uh, she earned her bachelor's degree in industrial engineering and a master's in biotechnology um, from the National in University of Ireland, Galway. Um, afterwards, she pursued a PhD in molecular biology at the University of Strathclyde. Uh, she's a renowned researcher of neurological disorders like multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease. In addition, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald is a pioneer in the effort to implement sustainable practices in scientific research. Uh, her group was actually the inaugural European recipient of the Green Lab certification uh, from the nonprofit organization, My Green Lab. And with that, I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Fitzgerald to the virtual stage, and she may begin her presentation now. Thanks very much, Isaac. I'll, I'll start uh, sharing now. Hold on. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today. And thank you, Isabella, <laughs> Isabel, for uh, inviting me to be here today. So what I'm going to do is give you, first of all, the kind of backstory in the big picture. I'm going to talk a little bit about the ACT label, and then I'll go on to our Greenland certification experience uh, and then mention some kind of ripple effects that have happened since then. Uh, and then we can finish with some final questions. Um, as mentioned already, I'm, I'm really a neuroscientist and it's only in the last few years that I've been, got involved in this lab greening effort. You know, I work on neuro neurodegenerative disorders and I work on a number of large EU projects uh, in, in Ireland. And in case any of you have never heard of it, Galway is on the west coast of Ireland, as shown here with the orange arrow. It's an old university, over 170 years old, and it has one of these nice old quads in it. Um, it's on the Atlantic, so we get this kind of cloud formation, and this is the engineering building that's shown here. Again, in front of the old quad in springtime, we have these lovely cherry blossoms, and you can see the old tower there, um, and a cathedral in the city, the river Carl goes through the city. This is just a stone's throw from campus. As I said, we're on the Atlantic. And <laughs> Isabel was mentioning Ed Sheeran's uh, video earlier for Galway Girl. And actually it was along this, this, this little piece of Galway here that it was filmed. Uh, 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 and this is the kind of thing you see. There are people who swim here in the sea every, every day of the year. Um, Galway City, pre-COVID, you know, a great nightlife in the city. Uh, and then Connemara itself, this beautiful landscape not far away from the city at all, a half an hour's drive outside the city. So really, I encourage you to come to Galway if you've never been before. You would be extremely welcome. Do come post-COVID. Uh, I'd love to see you here. But another way that I, I start these talks is to say, I mean, all of us, we, we love doing research, you know, but let's love our planet while we're doing it. And some of you may have already um, seen this report that was published by Oxfam last September. And one of the pieces of information that they reported on was that the richest 10% of the world's population were responsible for 52% of the cumulative carbon emissions. If you think about that, that, that just shows how challenging the problem of the climate crisis is. And then, you know, it kind of says, well, how, how can we as individuals do something about such an, an enormous problem? But I do believe, and this would be one of my main messages today, is that as a community of lab workers, we can make positive changes that will reduce the negative impact that our lab work has on the environment. And the backstory to my being here with you today is that 
honestly, it's nearly three years now since I read this particular book called No More Plastic. Um, and, and actually that author has written another one called No More Rubbish Excuses. But I read that in the summer of 2018. And of course, you know, it was giving all these horrific facts about, about plastic in general. But it made me start to read other famous climate related books. And you, I'm sure you'll recognize some of these here. This is Greta's book. Um, uh, and so I've been making my way through a lot of these and I'm getting more and more of them and sort of getting, uh, steeped in this, in this literature. And in fact, the one that I'm reading at the moment, which I highly, highly recommend, it's called Donut Economics. And let me know if any of you have heard of it, written by Kate Raworth. I strongly recommend this. And I'll be sort of touching on this later on in the talk. But what I discovered from thinking about plastic in general and looking it up online was that in Ireland at the moment, um, the average Irish person um, generates 35 kilograms of plastic waste per year. The figure that I have for the US is much bigger, it's 106. But following a study that was carried out in the University of Exeter, um, it was estimated that bench scientists generate an average of 1,000 kilograms of plastic waste per year. And this was done, in the, uh, this was reported in this paper from 2015, and it was published in Nature, so it was a short sort of letter, but it has had a, a huge impact, I think. And you'll see this paper quoted in many, many kind of green lab types of talks. Uh, but it was done based on 280 bench scientists, and this is their estimate. And then they extrapolated to 20,500 institutions worldwide, is what they said. And it just produced this, this huge kind of volume of plastic that was mentioned. So I think we all can agree that we do have a lab plastic problem. And I, I call it sometimes plastic creep. Uh, because when I was your age and I was doing um, my PhD and my, my postdoc in Scotland, I was using glassware, you know, in a, in a cancer research institute and then in the neuroscience uh, lab. And we were using glassware and it was working perfectly well. Um, but now what happens, you just don't see it in labs uh, for whatever reason. Uh, it's so convenient. We have large volumes of it. It's spilling out of our storage cupboards and we have this sort of thing. You can see the wrapped plastic in the bottom left here. We unwrap it. Uh, here, here are the items and there's the associated plastic waste. We have our tissue culture dis dishes, our multi-well plates, our tubes uh, wrapped, unwrapped, and then the associated waste. And you'll recognize these medium bottles for HBSS. Um, your tip boxes, your cell culture flasks, flasks and the associated packaging. And this, these are images from our lab. You know, we've got the bins that are overflowing with pipette tip boxes. We've got these two and a half litre plastic containers, high density polyethylene, very valuable. Uh, we can't get rid of them. And, and you'll all recognise these, these images that I'm sharing with you today. But before I go any further, I do want to acknowledge that lab greening in general is extra difficult during our COVID crisis. And in fact, in fact, this was addressed by an organization called Climate Outreach, um, which was founded in the UK. And about a year ago, they brought out a report specifically advising on how to communicate um, about climate change during the COVID crisis. I do recommend that you follow up on this and have a look at this report. If you have decided that you're going to go out and start talking to people about the climate, climate crisis, especially in the context of the lab, uh, of lab greening. And I'll come back to, uh, to mention uh, climate outreach again later in the talk. So yes, it's difficult to, to try and push this right now when everyone's focused on COVID. And plastic waste itself has become much, much worse since the COVID crisis. And this is being tracked by many organizations, for instance, Oceans Asia, uh, who, who, you know, from the beginning has been publishing these kinds of pictures about the PPE equipment that's just washing up on the shores around the globe. And then last summer, Channel 4, one of the UK stations, shockingly, you know, it, 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 it revealed the shocking conditions under which the PPE factories were supplying uh, the UK. Uh, so, so, you know, the, the workers that were hired in the factories were being crowded together in, in these um, accommodations. Uh, and the Guardian also reported on it here, see top glove, and they supply two thirds of the world's gloves. So I feel as if there's no doubt that we all have gloves that are made in this Malaysian factory. And then the Guardian also reported on um, uh, factories, uh, Chinese factories that are breaking UN sanctions and they're on uh, the border with North Korea. And uh, so, 
these people are working in conditions that may amount to modern slavery, which is very, very shocking. And you can see here a map showing where um, the items, the lab items that are being made there are being shipped to across the world. And just on learning these about these conditions and, and, and hearing about these stories, it, it, it has to make us think, well, you know, what is the provenance of our labware? How fair is it? Where is it manufactured? How is it manufactured? Under what working conditions is our lab equipment or our consumables being made? Why isn't there something like a fair trade label for labware? So how fair is our labware? Maybe this is something we should be asking as we handle all of the lab items, as we go about our daily lab work. So how can we make our labware fairer? And I think this is a really, really important question. And once you start to look at what you're doing in this way, it's very hard to stop doing that, if you like, once you become aware of it. And I think that the ACT label is possibly a step in the right direction. Uh, now, this is a label that has been, uh, it's a program that's run by My Green Lab, and I'm going to come back to My Green Lab. Uh, they call, and A stands for accountability, uh, C for consistent, consistency, and T for transparency. Um, so they have set this up, uh, and they call it an, a nutrition label for labware. Uh, and it tracks the environmental impact of lab products. And this is what the label looks like. Now, you can go online and, and sort of read the background to all of this and, and the explanations about the scoring. But basically, the lab product is scored according to how it's manufactured and the impact on the environment, uh, the user impact once it's in a lab, and then what happens to it once its, it's use is over, if you like. Um, and so the the... The idea is to get a low score. So high score is kind of red, uh, it's impact on the environment and low score is, is kind of towards the green end of things. And then you get a score at the end here. Uh, and so lowest score is the best and then high score is worst, except uh, with energy and water consumption, there's slightly different usage of numbers there. But anyhow, when you go onto the website, you'll see the lab products listed there within the categories of consumables, chemicals and reagents or equipment. So this is a good start because it is, uh, so you as someone in the lab, when you get something into the lab, you can start saying, does this have an ACT label? And you can start putting pressure, especially in the US, because the US has scale. We don't have the scale that you have. So it's much more difficult for us to put pressure on the big lab suppliers like Sigma or, or whoever. Um, and because this label has been ex expanded across the globe, originally there was just the US version of the label. Now there's an EU label and now since the UK you know, has left the EU, there's a UK version of it as well. And you can see that even, so these are three versions of the label for the same product. Uh, and the big thing that will differ here is that the shipping impact is 5.3 in the US label, but this goes all the way to 10 once it starts being shipped outside uh, the US. Uh, so that's at least a start. Um, now, James Connolly is the new CEO of My Green Lab and He's the ex-vice president of strategic growth for international future, the International Living Future Institute. But what I found really interesting about him was that he developed the JUST label and the DECLARE label. So I'm just going to show you the JUST label and we'll zoom in on it in a second. Um, but you can see here what's covered are those kind of points that we were talking about earlier to do with, with um, equity, diversity and inclusion whether or not this, uh, this company has employee benefits, stewardship, you know, does it get involved in local communities, equity, um, employee health, purchasing and supply chain. So I, I think this is really interesting and maybe this is something we need to think about. And when I spoke to James about this uh, recently, he did say that they were planning to add an equity component to the ACT label. Uh, and so I think that's really exciting and it's something to look forward to and it's a way that we can put pressure on lab supply companies to think about how fair their, their working conditions are. And it's all part of this sustainability, um, this way of looking at sustainability as requiring a balance between economics, ecosystems and equity. So all three of these have to be working together, if you like, for this stool not to topple over the three E's. 
it also fits with this idea of donut economics, where we need to operate within the donut in this safe and just space for humanity. We're not going along, uh, beyond the, the planetary boundaries, the ecological ceiling, and we're not going below this social foundation. We're making sure that everyone has this minimum requirements you know, for living. So I believe that we, you know, whatever we do with, within whatever sector has to feed into this sort of thing. We have to be thinking about it. It's very important. Um, but returning to the, the Galway's uh, lab greening story, um, all of the, that experience and, and reading all of these books and everything, thinking about it, um, I began to wonder, well, how could our labs become more sustainable by addressing plastic usage and other practices that impact our local environment? Uh, here's another image of the campus, and here's the River Carib that runs through Galway City. So you can see the campus is right on the river. Um, it does make me a bit scared that uh, rising sea levels are going to be an issue here for this campus if we don't do something about it. But anyhow, the Biomedical Sciences Research Building, where my office normally is, uh, pre-COVID, is here way in the edge of campus. Uh, and, but you can see the old quad here in the foreground. Uh, and this is the lab in this dedicated research building that was um, certified, and I'm going to talk about that now. But you can see that other wings in the building. So Quorum is the Science Foundation Ireland funded centre for research in medical devices. But we have a regenerative medicine institute, a centre for chromosome biology, a glycoscience cluster and an apoptosis research centre in the same building. Um, and these are the great uh, people in the green team that helped us get our certification. So on the top row, mostly PhD students, we got a bit of funding from Neil, uh, my senior researcher, Jill McMahon, a couple of technicians in the lab, um, and then a graphic artist and another PhD student. Apleona is a facilities management company that I know operates in the US, and Patrick was key in giving us information about our facilities, water, electricity, things like that. I don't have time to go into all of the other kind of programs that are out there for lab greening, but the one I went for in the end, um, which I found as the best roadmap, if you like, for lab greening was my green lab. And a big part of that decision was the fact that this is a non-profit organization. Um, and, and that's, that's, and because the whole thing was, was very straightforward when I started looking at it. And to get green lab certified, the first thing you have to do is a baseline assessment to gauge your current lab sustainability practices. And these are the categories under which you would be assessed. And basically it involves going online and answering a series of questions related to each of these different um, categories, you know, uh, and you can see them here. I don't, I don't need to call them out, but you know, the big themes, energy, water, waste, that sort of thing, transport. Okay. Um, and, and, the preference is that everyone in the lab would answer these questions and then you get a rating. And so when we answered the questions in March 2019, our average score under the categories uh, where we were assessed was 37%. Um, you need to get 40 to get your kind of entry level certification. And I think a lot of labs, especially more modern ones now like yours, should be able to achieve this pretty straightforwardly. Um, but then you work with My Green Lab for the next six, six to eight months to improve your scores and to demonstrate that you really do have a Green Lab program in place. And we took a lot of those questions and just converted them into these task lists. That was our approach. And then we kind of dished out the various tasks amongst our green team. And that was how we approached it. And, and, and that seemed to work. So this is an example of a couple of the, of the task lists that we generated. Um, and we did things like print out these stickers and put them onto bits of equipment that could be turned off after use or after a procedure or at the end of the day or not switch off at all. So clarifying that sort of thing by going through the equipment one by one. And this is what it looks like. Or putting these kind of stickers on the fume hoods, another classic way, you know, try and lower the sash, whole campaigns that are out there because it will significantly reduce the energy draw uh, in the lab. And then six months later, when we, re-answered the same questions, our score had more than doubled. So we were delighted with that and we got our certification and Alison Paradise, who was the CEO at that time, came over to Galway, visited the labs and we made a short movie about that, uh, which I'd be more than happy if you viewed this. There was a trailer and then a seven minute kind of documentary. Please do go and view that and, and share it with whoever you think might be interested. But the point was that, I mean, a main message, I suppose, from that is that 
individual actions can have far reaching impact. So uh, for whatever reason, it kind of worked at the timing then, you know, the idea of, of starting the Greenland program, but it has had quite a few repercussions. And I think largely because of that video being shared on social media, um, and lots of things happened at that time. And, and I, I was contacted by a lot of people. Um, so there was a ripple effect that was national and international. And, um, and, and one of the things was that I've ended up now being chair of a national group um, for public sector labs that was set up originally by Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. And I've really enjoyed being involved in that. Uh, and growing out of that, actually, uh, um, we have Irish Green Labs, sort of a network that's under development right now. And we hope to launch the website for that. So we would have like we state labs, we've got the, the various third level institutions now increasingly joining, but things like Irish Water, the State Laboratories, Environmental uh, Protection Agency, the Marine Institute. So any kind of lab uh, based uh, organization is, is coming into this, uh, this grouping, if you like. So that's one ripple effect. Um, another one was that we, again, growing out of that group, we entered uh, Science Foundation gave us Science Foundation Ireland gave us a, a little bit of money to look at plastics in labs. And we ended up doing a national survey in February this year, again, across all of those different sectors that have labs. And we got 148 respondents from 80 different labs. We carried out 24 stakeholder interviews and we gathered some interesting data. These are the people who were involved in that project and students uh, who actually crunched the data. Um, so all the public sector lab categories were represented. So that would, but mostly it was kind of weighted in terms of research labs, but there were teaching labs, uh, biology labs, non, but no non-bio labs, but chemical chemistry labs and other kinds. But people, Lots of different kinds of roles were represented, fortunately, lab managers, research assistants, uh, students, uh, principal investigators and technical officers. Um, but some common themes did emerge that maybe so out of 147, 63 seemed to know what to do with the plastic waste. You know, the majority of people definitely wanted to adopt sustainable uh, materials uh, and they did feel, let's say half of them felt that they could use a washed and returned, uh, sterilized and returned uh, plastic or alternatives. Um, you know, the vast majority did believe that social and environmental concerns are very, very important and they do want more sustainable alternatives. And everyone pretty much agreed that plastic waste is a problem. Uh, but the barriers were things like that plastic can't be recycled, maybe some types of plastic, or that it was very unclear how to do it, or that there was no system in place. Uh, because of a lack of communication, people didn't really know what to do. Uh, regulation within certain labs would prevent um, some of the plastic being reused or contamination was always a big concern, you know, what would happen to the plastic or how could it be decontaminated. But the top plastic items that were wasted in Irish labs, and it must be the same where you are, gloves, pipette tips, tubes, Eppendorf tubes, tip boxes, multi-well dishes, petri dishes, and tissue culture flasks. I don't think you're going to be surprised with that, those findings there. But the main findings uh, in the end were a lack of awareness, so a need for education around lab plastics, the environment, behaviour, psychology. There's overwhelming support in Ireland for lab greening initiatives uh, and huge interest in discovering and implementing more sustainable lab practices. But definitely concerns around contamination, residual detergents and regulatory restrictions that would, regulatory restrictions that would prevent even the processing of lab waste into other products. Um, so that's a bit of a barrier at the moment. But there is interest from the Irish polymer sector in testing waste lab plastic resins. But let me just move on to um, examples of good green lab practice elsewhere. Uh, and in particular, one example, um, many of you may have heard of the Roslyn Institute uh, in Scotland. Uh, it's actually most famous for creating Dolly the sheep, the first cloned mammal. So that's really why it became famous. And that's why I think this publication from them is really, really important for, for people in Laos because this institution has a lot of respect. Uh, and so the paper came out in, I think it was September last year, and it was a case report for insights into reducing plastic waste 
in a microbiology lab. So specifically for micro. Uh, what I liked about it is that they had a protocol that they detailed here explaining how they decontaminate their tubes uh, and, and you know all about the detergents and everything that was used and the timings uh, and then how, how they kept those tubes sterile so that they could reuse them. And then they detailed in a table exactly which tubes they were talking about, who the suppliers were, the catalog number, how many of the items were used, the costs, and then whether or not those things were autoclavable. And then this nice graphic here, just comparing the blue to the orange, I think you can, you can see that the orange bars are lower. Uh, and they were showing um, how they reduce the number of single-use plastic items for these different kind of steps in, within the lab. Um, and so they, th these practices were implemented over a seven-week period, and then they quantified the amount of money saved and the greenhouse gas emissions avoided and things like that. So I think that's a really, really nice example. There aren't many of them out there that are published, you see, and I think that's part of the problem. We need to gather this data and publish it so that other scientists can see it and say, hey, I'm going to do that myself. The, the second ripple effect that I want to mention is um, environmental education. So the ripple effect from our lab greening. And that is that we, you know, the way I described the lab greening in Galway, it, it sort of made it sound really, really straightforward. But, you know, it, it, we did encounter some pushback, you know, from people within the lab, pushing back on this, on this greening that we were trying to do. And it made me wonder why, because I think, with all of you now here today who are, who are at the talk, or, or the fact that you've invited me at all means that there are quite a few of you already um, at the Huck Institute who are interested in lab greening. So you're on board and you can't really understand why other people aren't instantly interested. Um, <clears throat> and Greta, when she was interviewed in New York, I think it was the end of 2019, and she was on the Trevor Noah show, I think it was 2019. She was over there for the UN meeting anyway, and when Trevor Noah was asking her, you know, what, well, like, what can, this is such a massive problem. What can a single person do? You know, they're not going to have much impact. And she said, well, the first step is to become informed. And I suppose it was that thinking that made us um, develop a graduate module on green lab principles and practice. Uh, and it's kind of like climate change 101 is one way of thinking about it for mostly people who've never done environmental science, you know, so it touches on atmosphere and climate change, sustainability, the SDGs, metrics, biodiversity and ecosystems, environmental psychology, sociology, climate change, communication, environmental ethics, leadership and governance and the circular economy. So quite a, quite a broad range of topics, but the idea was to give lab workers kind of a firm footing for engaging in conversations with others about the lab. And so, and then, of course, they'd learn about how lab activities impact the environment and how to implement green lab practices. And the psychology of climate action, some would say, well, the battle for climate action and for, the cli for solving the climate crisis is in the mind. Um, and this is the kind of thing you might encounter if you go into labs, that you, you will hear people responding emotionally, or they'll say things like, well, I'm already treating COVID or curing cancer or Alzheimer's or whatever. I actually don't have time for this. How much is it going to cost? Who's going to pay? You know, what difference will this make? You know, we're just one lab in Galway in Ireland. And, you know, it, or this is too risky. I, I can't even think about it. Or global warming might not be happening, although that's a shrinking population. And within the, the session that we do on the psychology of climate change, these are the topics that we cover. We, 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 we cover the intrapsychic factors that form part of the human response to climate change. And then we, we cover psychosocial moderators and mediators that influence individual and social responses. And then we cover a thing called the dragons of inaction, which I'm going to come to. Uh, and then how to formulate a, a personal roadmap for mitigating against your own and society's negative impact on the environment. So we're trying to kind of push the seesaw from this inaction uh, over to the action part. And these dragons are something that I really want to make you aware of if you haven't heard of them already. These were, this is a concept that Professor Robert Gifford in Canada, a psychologist, has developed over the last couple of decades. He's been working on it for quite a, a while. But there's this very nice article in New Scientist from 2015, which I recommend if you want to learn about it. But it's 33 reasons why we can't clearly think clearly about climate change. 
And he says that he calls them dragons of an action because they are a drag on action. Uh, and these 33 dragons are in seven fearsome families and here they are listed. So it's kind of amusing, but also quite important because he's trying to find a, a, a sort of a way of, of describing all of these different influences on everybody, on humans, you know, in relation specifically to climate change. So I think that's, that's really important. So on all of those kinds of psychological influences will influence an approach to promoting pro-environmental behavior. Uh, and, and communication skills are absolutely key for this. Uh, and you may have to think about this. Um, and I mentioned the climate outreach um, organization or at the start of the talk. And George Marshall is a climate change communicator. He's English, but he's a co-founder of Climate Outreach. And the resources there are available online. They're all free. Uh, and they advise you on how to communicate to different kinds of audiences, whether it's business or academics or, you know, depending on your, audience, your, your local council or your local community, how do you talk to people about climate change? And it's, it's really, really fascinating stuff. So I really recommend it. But the point is that I'm making here is that he says that how we frame our climate impact narrative is key to influencing others that common values need to be identified and that people's emotions must be engaged in order to trigger climate action. So the question then for us or for you today is have you figured out what works for or doesn't work when you discuss our climate crisis with your friends or colleagues or family? Or what is PSU's Green Lab narrative? What is the Huck Institute's Green Lab narrative? How, like those kind of points are really important when you start the conversation, especially if you want widespread support. Here, this slide, and I'll be sharing the slides anyway, giving you the slides, but I recommend that you just watch this video if you want to learn more about George Marshall. Um, and I think all of that stuff is really important. So the challenges, if you are embar embarking on a Green Lab pro pro program, are that different labs will have different practices, different pressures, that a, the attitudes to climate change will vary. Personal uh, people will be influenced um, by their neighbors or by their social groups. Awareness of individual responsibilities is not that great, especially within labs. People have no idea what the impact of what they are doing is having on the environment. The upfront, upfront cost of certification, may it, it shouldn't really be much of a barrier. It's not that expensive at all. Um, and then we can get into that in the discussion if you like. Um, replacing plastic with glassware, it is costly, you know, but in the end it'll pay for itself. And then procurement and purchase, purchasing is a big theme um, within lab greening. Um, so to summarize, <clears throat> I talked about the big picture and the, and the backstory. I mentioned the ACT label as a way of putting pressure on lab suppliers to think about the conditions under which their equipment and consumables are made. I briefly mentioned our green lab certification experience and the knock-on effects, the knock-on positive effects um, nationally um, and ed educationally. And then the final questions, of course, being, well, can we make our lab work fairer? I think that lab workers need to agitate for fairer practices within labs um, or within the, 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 the manufacturing facilities for lab wear. But achieving this requires an understanding of psychological influences and how lab greening is framed. So I'm really interested to hear what is PSU's plan for greening of labs? That should say has, sorry, has any lab been registered with MGL, with My Green Lab yet? Um, and just to finish, I'd like to acknowledge these people here. Um, on, on the left-hand side, Ian, Gesha and Katrina are all contributing to the Green Labs module. Sinead Wanyan, Wanyan which, mean, which is Janet Mannion in Irish, is uh, in charge of waste management for Connacht and Ulster, two of our provinces in Ireland. Uh, and then Paul is the registrar, the deputy president, who set up this Community University Sustainability Partnership. Michelle O'Dowd is our sustainability officer, and Jamie Goggins chairs that group. Thank you very much for listening, and um, I'm very happy to take your questions right now. Um, thank you for this excellent talk. Um, so we have a few questions coming in from the chat. 
Um, but first from David, he, he's asking how many other labs at your university have joined in this My Green Lab process? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what happened, I, I showed you the picture of that building. So in fact, when I got that bit of funding, it ended up being a thousand euros from a local kind of innovation fund. Um, and that helped to pay for things like bins and, and some posters that we printed. But to get that funding, I had actually had 35 names or something like that. And that was because there was a green team that was nominally set up in each of those wings. But the only one that was actually ready um, was the Coram Lab. And Coram is the Irish word for care, by the way. Um, so there are other labs that are have sort of begun the process but haven't got to certification and COVID just kind of stalled everything. Um, there's a lab on the hospital grounds that's still part of the university that was certified the January after November. So we've got two that are certified already. Um, but what, what did happen, I, and again, I think it was fairly random, you know, that we just decided to make the video that it got made really quickly. Science Foundation Ireland found out about it and Alison and myself ended up joining their conference when she was over and it just the publicity happened really quickly so that was good um but because of that um the university i persuaded the university to make it part of their strategy and so certification of all labs on campus is now part of the university strategy between now and 2025 but we have about 200 labs on campus. Uh, so it's quite a challenge. And uh, so in answer to that question, we have two that are certified. The certification lasts for two years. So we have to re renew our certification, but I'm not really worried about that. I'm sure we'll be able to renew it. Um, but what I've promised this year is that we will get another five certified this year. And now I'm going to really ramp up after that. So some of my time is actually being bought out to strategize the certification. So I do think that's important. I think if you don't get senior support, it makes the whole job a bit harder, you know, and you do need a senior person, I suppose, because I relatively senior was kind of driving it locally in that building, you know, and within that research center. And having someone like that who's very proactive and helping is a big thing. But the second lab that was funded, or sorry, that got certification was wholly a PhD student that drove that. You know, she was amazing, <laughs> absolutely amazing. Um, so there probably there's probably more than one route to the same place. Um, but I mentioned cost. The cost is it's a thousand dollars to work with my green lab for the whole of the organisation. So for PSU, a thousand dollars a year that's not much money, right? And then per lab after that, it's up. It's either one hundred and seventy five or three fifty dollars per lab which again is nothing you pay more for an antibody you know <laughs> so to me money is not the barrier the barrier is just take i suppose you're going out of your comfort zone you know really as as and you're a life science like life scientist so you're going out of your comfort zone in a way and going into environmental stuff you know and i know you're you're really busy because especially now if you're in third year or fourth year but you know, what you need to do is call her the first years and the second years and get them to, to run with it. But um, having said that, the, the students you saw in the picture there, they were all um, they were all fourth years when they took, took that on, you know. Um, so, I mean, we didn't know what we were doing in the beginning, but somehow it kind of it, it worked out eventually. We, we did it. Everyone was very motivated. Um, so we have a question from Andrew Reid. Uh, uh, were any of the, in your experience, green labs more or less prone to some of the supply chain failures we've been experiencing um, over the last year? Um, I don't think, well, the, whether or not you're green or not, we've been having supply chain issues. Yes, absolutely. But our issues are compounded by the fact because of Brexit. You know, <laughs> So it's not just COVID. Brexit is causing us a problem. So we're having medium running out. You know, I'm, I'm being contacted by a different institution to say, has anyone got this medium? RPMI, you've probably heard of it. You know, we've run out of RPMI. We can't feed our cell line, you know, and it's supply from the UK. So our biggest problem is Brexit. Um, but in terms of whether it's green or not, that I don't think that's impacting the supply chain, if you like. Um, the influence on the supply chain is coming from procurement. And what we're trying to do is influence the criteria for approving new suppliers or for renewing contracts. And so now we're, we're applying a kind of a green filter, but it's only worth 10%. 
you know, the way the, the criteria for choosing a supplier for having one approved, the top um, weighting is given obviously to the price and to um, what's being supplied, the quality of what's being supplied. And then sustainable impact or the, the environmental impact is way down, you know, it's at 10%. So we have to kind of, and I'm trying to argue for equity when it should be at the same level as price and the product itself and the environmental impact. But it's really hard to make that argument, you know, because we're stuck in contracts with supply companies, you know. So it's a case of trying to find out when those contracts are being renewed and then, but you need the more senior people to do that for you, you know. Um, but, but the main thing I would say to people in your position and uh, the people in the labs is think about your own protocols. I'm trying to think about what you're doing yourself, you know, um, and see if there's one thing that you can change. So there's two things I mentioned. One is that, you know, I'm a neuroscientist, so we, we dissect brain tissue, you know, and personally, I, I was up there demonstrating a dissection to a student. Uh, I just took a little bit of brain tissue, put it in a Petri dish, a plastic one. I walked 10 paces and then I took it out, <laughs> put it into something else and then threw out the plastic dish, right? So when you think about items of plastic that you use for less than a minute, you know, and you go, and, and that's a low risk piece of work. You know, I know it was sterile. I walked at 10 paces and I, so now I've replaced those with glass that we wash ourselves, you know, because we're not using a whole load of them. It's just in a given prep, I might be using 10 or 20 or something like that. I don't need to, it's very low. So identifying your low risk protocols and say, well, can I? And look what the Roslyn Institute did. That's fascinating to me because they're reusing the plastic as well. You know, each time you reuse a piece of plastic, you're not buying it again, you're saving money. You know, yes, there's time involved in cleaning it and those sort of things. But what we need is more labs actually going through that exercise of working through it and figuring out. You know, so if everyone in lab identified one protocol, and the second thing to look at is chemistry. And there's a tool on the, I think it's the Sigma Aldrich, uh, Merck Sigma, I think it is, or Merck Millipore. I, I lose track because they keep you know, buying uh, bits of each other. But there's a tool called Dozen, D-O-Z-N, actually D-O-Z-N. That tool will help you, you. You can go put a protocol online in there and it will identify the chemicals that you can substitute that are less toxic to you and to the environment, you know. And so I'm really interested in, in that tool that's available. And in fact, the guy who was driving that is now working, uh, I don't know, is he working with Migraine Lab or if he's on the board or something like that. So Migraine Lab is now so well connected, especially across the US. Um, the network, there's a free ambassador, Green Lab ambassador program as well. So you get trained, you can get a digital badge and you can be the Green Lab ambassador. So that's one way to approach the lab greening at PSU is to, to do that first. And then, then you're sort of well-trained to sort of embark on, on the program. Uh, and that's very popular. So there have been a few comments that there are some talks about um, making oh. greener initiatives at Penn State. Um, one coming from primarily, uh, I believe, material science. Oh, um, yeah. Fantastic. Um, so that's great. Um, another question yeah. um, is coming from Tarek. He, he had an experience in a, a lab yeah. prior to Penn State where um, yeah. the, the facilities were actually resisting um, reusing some of these materials. Is that something you encountered? Yeah. I mean, what I believe is that, again, it's, it's through groupings like this and it's through scientists talking to each other uh, and identifying those examples like the one from the Roslyn Institute and say, look, this is a world renowned institute and it's rewashing its plastic. But the point about the recycling, sort of the offset, what happens to the waste once it leaves your facility, it's entirely location dependent. So we're in, because Ireland is so small and, and very well connected, we are trying to have that conversation with the waste processing people. So the recycling people, you know, plus the regulators um, for reclassifying what's coming out of the lab. Not, not, once it's classified as waste, it's very hard to recycle it. So, you know, we have to come up with a new term, you know, that it's some kind of a commodity because 
Like, look at those medium bottles. You know the medium bottles? They're in PET. PET is the most recyclable plast- resin because it's what's used in water bottles. So, and from... And in Ireland, you know, we have very little capacity at the moment, very little, practically no infrastructure for recycling our own plastic waste. You wouldn't believe this. So we actually import recycled plastic to make our plastic products in Ireland. We don't make any lab products. right? And at the same time, we take our high quality plastic waste and we export it for someone else to recycle outside Ireland. (laughs) It doesn't make a lot of sense at the moment. But there is some effort at the moment to set up pet recycling, for instance. Um, so that is the first one that maybe, re- and so the, the people in Ireland are going to look at our pet bottles because they're, you know, they're much thicker than a water bottle. Does anyone use those? Do you know the ones I'm talking about? Those square plastic bottles? They're made of pet polyethylene terephthalate. From what I've learned so far, it's the most recyclable plastic. Yeah, it's with all your Coca-Cola bottles and your all of that. They're all made from PET. Um, so the infrastructure is there to recycle that in most countries. But for us, any of the other resins, not yet in Ireland, but I think it's because our, China has stopped accepting this plastic, non-industrial waste plastic, every country in the world is looking at this. They're looking for their local solutions, you know. So I think that's where it's headed. Dr. Olna. Um, I know you focus mainly on plastic, yes. waste, but what are your thoughts like after those years of, of experience with um, yeah. energy waste in yeah. laboratories? Right. So the top, the first thing that seems to be the most effective. So number one, actually, what I do recommend is that you go onto the Migraine Lab web- website and try to access videos from their, um, from their summit. I wasn't able to make it this year, but last year, there was a talk by Alison Farmer, and she is an expert on energy draw, you know, within labs. And anyway, you'll find links um, from some very good lab greening programs that already exist in the US as well, you know, that pre-existed micro lab, if you like, but they were institution specific programs that were there. Uh, and the University of Colorado is one of them. And they have a big, long list of energy efficient freezers. So if you're buying a new freezer, there's a star rating now for free, for some electrical equipment in the US. And you can make a decision based on the minimum environmental impact. But a key thing, if you can, you would up chill your ultra low temperature freezers. For example, when I was your age, the freezers were minus 70s. They were not minus 80s. And all the companies did was they said, hey, we can chill this to minus 80, you know, but actually the researchers don't need to have their samples at minus 80. So the first thing we did was we up chilled our freezers to minus 70. Unfortunately, in our wing, that was fine. I can understand if we have human samples and we, we do, but I still decided that even our human tissue samples, it was okay, you know. Um, but there are labs that are trying to do side by side comparisons, you know, between RNA or whatever that's stored at minus 80 or minus 70. I'm, I think it depends on your situation. So it may be that some of your freezers can be up chilled to minus 70, or you can reorganize your samples to enable that to happen. Uh, and there's a thing called the freezer challenge that's run by Migraine Lab as well um, that you can enter. Um, uh, and um, it, it, it sort of leads you through the process of trying to save, uh, remanage your freezers, like hoovering the filter regularly, having a proper inventory of the samples there, because you know what it's like, people who left the lab 10 years ago still have samples in the freezers, um, or not storing DNA at minus 80. You know, it can be, it doesn't have to be at minus 80 you know, at all. Things like that. The second thing is your fume hoods. Um, lowering the sash or turning them off, not storing waste in the fume hoods. Uh, the third thing is the air vac system because that's really the biggest draw. You know, the other kind of small equipment based items don't have a huge impact. Um, it's the end, it's it's the draw of the air from the fume hoods as well. You know, so if you close the sash, it slows down the fans, so the energy draws less. But what I think is missing is information on the fume hood about that. You will save 
this amount of energy if you lower the sash. We haven't got there, you know. And it will prevent, avoid these greenhouse gases, this amount. That's what I think has to be there. So the information needs to be there. And then persuasion, you know, what you do will influence the people either side of you on the bench. There's no doubt about that. You know, leading by example is big. You know. Are you planning to include hospitals in this initiative? Yes. Yes, they are incredibly keen on this. So the health and safety executive in Ireland, in fact, they've been they've been um, very, very keen on this. And I was very quickly invited to give a talk to the sustainable, the lab sustainability people in the hospital in Galway. But also they've joined now this Irish Green Lab kind of network. Um, very enthusiastic about it. Yeah. Um, so, again, it's 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 different, but I think in a way. Because those labs are so tightly regulated, um, you could say, well, actually, it's less chaotic than the research labs, you know, because with the research labs, you've got so many little groups. So in our building, you know, like 35 different people like me, you know, <laughs> whereas if you have one lab manager in a micro lab, one lab manager in a biochem lab, and do you know what I mean? It's, it, it could be more straightforward. But yeah, they're totally on board um, about this. And they're, I think... It, it, in all of those sectors, there are people interested in pursuing the, the Green Lab certification. Yeah, it's become a big thing in Ireland, yeah. So um, it's when it's things like the water testing labs and they have a protocol that they have to follow. They can't switch even from plastic to glass without amending the protocol and getting it approved. So under those conditions, it can take a lot more effort to make changes. Um, but yeah, I think the hospital labs, they have to do something because the waste is phenomenal from there now. You know, with COVID, it's just a nightmare. Yeah, in general, people are interested. I think it is possible to start with small things. It's definitely possible, especially in like your Huck Institute. You have a brand new building, haven't you? Well, relatively new. So those new buildings get through this process much more quickly. Like the one I showed you in Ireland was a relatively new building. It was five years old. So it meant that it already had motion sensitive lighting you know some people leave the lights go off do you know what i mean those things count um and 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 with the water management and everything so it's it's if you have a newish lab it would be very straightforward to get the certification but what the certification does is it helps to raise awareness about these different things and um, that's why i think it's a good thing to do uh, and then once it's set up as long as the, I think the technical staff are absolutely key as well. So if the technical staff are on board, they're the ones who really have the knowledge about what's going on in the lab, you know. Um, great. Well, thank you for presenting. It's been great having you talk about your experience. <laughs>